So now we're going to look at um, some actual uh, reconditioning of the cylinder and we'll go over the different components uh, that we use or uh, things we can use and the advantages and disadvantages of both. Um, I'll show you the tools and then I'll show you the, uh, the, the way they're used in the block and then we'll see uh, what kind of a, a, a pattern we get from that actual machining. Okay, looking at a block here, we're going to look at some cylinder reconditioning and uh, just to try and give you a bit of an idea, you can see what we're looking at on the side of that cylinder is the reflection of a uh, trouble light uh, off of the very smooth, shiny uh, cylinder surface and we refer to that as being glazed. Now, the one I'm actually going to work on is over here and you can see that uh, I have done this one a little bit uh, before and it's a quite a bit duller surface and we'll look at uh, how we go about getting that to have the right angle of crosshatch. So this is the first one we're going to be using and this is a rigid hone. Uh, with a rigid hone it is, it is one uh, line all the way down and that's what allows us to actually uh, control the shape of the cylinder or make the, the, the cylinder a cylindrical shape. Um, some of the other ones we're going to look at later uh, will simply just change the, the, the dimension of the cylinder, not actually change the shape of the cylinder. This one has two uh, sliders that are opposite each other and, and basically just keep the, the stone centered in the bore and then the two stones which are going to do our uh, grinding and removing of material. All right, when you put it in, uh, there are different varieties of, of that, but by tightening this, what we actually are doing is putting tension on the stones and the sliders out on the cylinder walls. Now be careful, don't go too much. Uh, uh, an, an excess of tension will uh, cause this drill to, to turn in your hand. Now before we get going any further too, um, we do want to do is have a little bit of lubricant on that cylinder wall. We don't do this dry, it's just very hard on the stone and it actually would make it uh, work really well in that a lot of material would come off very fast and we might going oversized for what we want. Now depending on what uh, what type of material or how much material you're looking at removing, uh, you may want to use a, a, a lubricant that suits. If you were at the, the, the beginning of this and you have a lot of material to remove, um, maybe something lighter, and I've got some WD-40 here, or even diesel fuel would work um, just as well. Um, and then engine oil. When you get near the end or if you don't have very much to take off and you're just basically deglazing the cylinder, uh, maybe a little bit of engine oil and that will, will help your stones last long, longer and, and not take as much off the cylinder wall. So we're going to use a little bit of engine oil in here today just because it will help, uh, help us show the pattern. Just need an a, a ounce or two in there, let it run down along the stones and when it gets down then we can start uh, machining and that'll do a good job of spreading it around. All right, so make sure you got a good grip, grip on, the, on the drill so that it doesn't rotate in your hand. And simply work it back and forth. Now, a couple of things to watch for. We don't want to end up with a condition where we come out too far and have the, the, the stones come out and start flopping around. We also don't want to go beyond the, uh, the point um, at the bottom of the cylinder where it might hit something at the bottom of the block. Everything, this block is, is completely bare, there's nothing in it, the crank has been removed, but um, in the webbing of the block on, on the bottom, it actually sticks out beyond the cylinder and if I go too deep, I'm going to, I'm going to rub my stone or bang my stone against it and that will be the end of that stone. Um, Take a kind of a quick uh, look and see where your, your, your uh, hone is going into and that will give you an idea on how deep you need to go. Alright, so we're going to do a couple of ones first. Now with this, I, I see until you figure out exactly how much you want to be, uh, be moving it in and out. Because what we are looking for is a 60 degree angle on the crosshatch. 
So stop after you've done a couple of passes at a certain speed or a speed you think that you're going to be working at and see if that is giving you that 60. Now this is a slightly, it's slightly flat from what I, what I, I should be having. So uh, in order to make an adjustment on that, I can either slow down the revolution of the drill or increase my, my reciprocating of it in and out until I get that 60 degree pattern. We'll try it again a little bit more and see what we can do. And I'm going to put a little bit more tension on it. All right. Now, uh, we're obviously not taking very much off. Um, I'm going to stop the camera and move it over so you can 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 see uh, what I'm talking about about checking the angle, and then we'll come back and we'll try another style. So there it is, looking at the cylinder wall, and you can see the angle of that. And that that angle there is actually pretty good. If you look at the the old cylinder wall. You can kind of see the rem the remnants of the uh, the crosshatch pattern in there, and and that's from the factory. And then this one is approximately pretty close to the same thing. So that is the kind of angle that we are looking at. So this is the second one, and this is the the flex hone. All right. Uh, now with this one, um, this one's there are different uh, makes and models of these. Um, you can get ones that are slightly heavier. Um, this would only be used in the cylinder for deglazing. All right. If the cylinder had anything wrong with the shape, uh, it, it simply would uh, make it a bigger diameter or larger diameter, but with the same shape, so it wouldn't really repair anything. Um, thing with this one is they, they I mean, they're they're fairly cheap to buy, um, but. As again, it's not going to correct anything wrong with the cylinder. Now, just to show you uh, a little bit of a difference, I'm going to use this one and we're going to show you what happens when we uh, increase the RPM of the drill and, and not change the amount that we, we reciprocated in and up and down in the cylinder. All right. Um, with this one as well too, the higher the speed you travel with it, there's more centrifugal force out on these springs to make it work against the cylinder wall, which is kind of the, the design of it. Now there are some too where uh, you can, uh, by making an adjustment on the screw here, put some additional tension on it to make it work harder against the cylinder wall and take more material off faster. All right, and then looking in at the cylinder, uh, I mean, without, I don't know, not sure whether it'll show up on the thing, but essentially the lines going around that cylinder now are, are pretty much uh, uh, straight around. There's no angle to it up and down at all. The last one we're going to look at is this one, which is a ball hone. Um, these are, are little carbon balls with an abrasive uh, bonded into it. They are spring loaded onto uh, you know, very, uh, like, almost like a, a, a bottle brush. Uh, they, are, they are available in different diameters. Um, you can, these are not like just fitting one size. As long as you have some tension or resistance against the cylinder wall, it will work well for you. Now this uh, tool is actually used, would only be used for deglazing that cylinder. Uh, you wouldn't use this to try and change the, the dimension or the size or, or go up or you'd, uh, you'd be there an awfully long time. But for like the earlier cylinders when we looked at them where it had a very glossy finish to it, uh, you could run this in and out uh, 10 or 20 times and that would break up that service when you were doing a, an engine job and, and maybe uh, replacing rings and you want a, a nice crosshatch pattern with a, 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 a little micro inch surface on there to, to get the proper wear in. And the same thing will give you a little demonstration. This one I'm just going to use a, a little bit of WD-40 in there first and I'll show you that what would happen going the other way. All right, 
So with that, we end up where the, 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 the lines or the scratches on the side of the cylinder wall are more uh, along the way that, it, that the piston would be reciprocating and the, the angle is too steep. It won't be very good for your rings and it will lead to a early failure on the engine. All right, but that is from going too slow and reciprocating in and out too fast. So let's start with a, a little bit of an inspection and description of of the block or the bottom end of the block. Um, these are my my main bearing journals. All right. So one of the inspections we will would have to do on that is check for to make sure that these are true. All right. And what we need for that is a straight edge and a thickness gauge or a feeler gauge. Uh, now, with with the the right thickness of gauge for what your uh, your specifications allow for clearance. Um, but what we are going to do with this straight edge is position it along three places around this this block. All right. So the first one is the easiest is right in the bottom and then simply try your thickness gauge and see whether it's going to to pass through underneath that. All right. Then from that we would do the other side, uh, you know, the one side, and then the opposite side to make sure that they are are, are in contact or, or straight. What this is determining is that that they are in the correct alignment, and everything will uh, will not uh, cause a problem later. All right. So moving on from that, I want to kind of go through and have a description of the oil flow through the block. All right. Over here on this side, we have the mounting uh, spot would be location for the, um, the oil filter, um, the uh, pressure regulator, and the, uh, the cooler running down the side of the block. Um, I'm going to use this, which is a, uh, just an ordinary tie wrap to show you. When we look at the block, and I'm going to spin it around a little bit further so you can see, all right? You'll notice that there is a, a, a usually some kind of an extra uh, material here uh, in the casting of the block. That casting then is drilled from one end of the block to the other, and that intersects with the oil pressure uh, gallery, and that supplies oil pressure all along here. And I have this one removed, but we have another one over here. one right here and we have uh, this one here would actually line up right there alright and you can see how far in that goes and that actually lines up if you look at it then where the oil hole comes into the bottom of that main journal same with this one goes through and if I hold it up over the top you can see that it, it comes in where that that journal is alright that is how we get oil into the main journal. All right. So from this position, all right, we also have a drilling that goes all the way down to the camshaft. All right. So the journal bearings on the camshaft will get lube at the same time or from the same source as my main journals. All right. Okay, so now we know that the oil is, is fed from this gallery through a drilling and a cross drilling and it comes up into the main journal. I want to talk about the, the oil, actual oil or, or uh, friction bearing that would sit in there. All of the friction bearings in the top half must have a hole to allow the oil then to come through into the bearing and around my, my main journal. All right, when we are putting the bearings in, make sure that your surface of your journal is clean and dry. No oil is required on the back side of the bearing. 
it actually will hinder it. It will actually uh, allow that bearing to, to rotate in the bore a whole lot easier uh, if we leave oil on the back side of it. Um, the other thing to look at, and we've talked about this a, a little bit, is that we have the tab in the correct position. So it must be located, and there's only one on each journal, and it must fit in flush. All right. There should be a little bit of, of, of drag to put that in so that it will stay in position while we're getting the rest of them in place. I wanted to show you that another caution to, be, to watch for is that sometimes the bearing sets will be uh, sent to you and they will only have a hole for oil in one half of the bearing you must make sure that that bearing is the one that is in the top. If you switch them, they will fit, but this will stop all of the oil from entering that main journal and it will have a very, very short life. This would go in the cap. Now, some bearing sets will come where they are, have holes in both sides, so it eliminates that, that problem or thing to watch for. All right? Uh, another thing that we want to look at is the style of bearings, all right? Um, you, this is a, a much easier way of doing this in that uh, you don't end up having to worry about uh, positioning your, your thrust bearings at that because it's a one-piece thing, all right? Same rules are going to apply for the rest of it, though. Check and see that it, where the hole is so you have the right bearing check for the location of the tab so that you have the right orientation and position it in it. Now, what you will find on, on these is that um, where we, are, we have these, these combination uh, radial and uh, axial thrust bearings that they usually fit on a machine surface. They, they won't fit on any other journal. They're usually too big or won't, or, 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 or too long. All right. If we put it in the right one in this thing, the, the oil hole will line up. The same style of bearing is used then in for in the cap for that main, and we have a thrust surface on here. Um, when we are installing these, the tab on the cap always goes on the same side as the tab on the block. All right, or if it was a connecting rod, side of the connecting rod. And that's how my, my, my cap and my journal would be positioned. Okay, so we're gonna continue. We're gonna look at, at some of the things on a crankshaft and show you and describe them. Uh, look at the proper ways to inspect them and measure them and uh, we'll see how that goes and kind of tidies up our, our whole block uh, uh, theme. So on our block, because we have it set up and I've gone ahead and got this ready, uh, what I want to start is shaft, crankshaft run out. Now in order to do this, you need to have an adapter onto your dial gauge that is long enough that is going to allow the counterweights and the webs and the crank pins to pass it uh, and uh, clearly without interfering or giving it a bump. All right, now I, I have it set up. It's not a, a, an ideal uh, set of V blocks, but it will work for this just for the demonstration purposes. A um, Couple of things, and as I roll this around, uh, I want to, to show you that you can see that my, my indicator rod is slightly off center on the center main journal. I want to support it in the V blocks on the two outermost uh, journals and I want to take my reading on the center journal. But I also want to leave a little bit off and if as I roll this around you will see that that is the oil hole that we're going to describe in a few minutes. and what I want to make sure is that as I'm rotating this around that my my rod isn't going to poke into that hole and, and, and move everything. Alright, I'm going to move the camera now and zoom in a little bit so that you can see the dial and uh, we can watch this.
So now hopefully you can see the dial and uh, while we're moving, moving this, a um, couple of things I want to say is that when you start to rotate this, um, you are going to see that I, I go in a slow, continuous roll. If you can see the dial and you see that if I have little jerks and, and stop and change direction, that the needle actually moves. Well, because of the length of the needle and the drag, um, what I want to do, I want to have happen is that I, I do a nice slow, easy, continuous that, and if you can see the dial, the needle is moving very, very little. All right, um, so, and that's an indication of it's, it's pretty good. Now, when you were setting this up, uh, a lot of people will want to zero the needle exactly. That's, that's not really necessary. Uh, if you're somewhere close, because what will happen if you have any run out in your shaft, what will happen is the needle will move in one direction and then it will move back in the opposite direction until it, it comes back, the, the amount it, it, of that it, clearance we have or the amount of bend we have, if we have any. Uh, and I'll show you on another crank what that actually would look like. So when we are, are calculating this, it would be um, how much it moves in one direction and then how much it moves back in the opposite direction. So if it moved three thou clockwise and two thou counterclockwise of the zero, that would mean that my total indicated run out would be five thousandths of an inch. All right. Um, we'll, we'll, well, I'll set up another uh, crankshaft and show you, but what I'll go ahead and do now is show you some of the things for measuring a... Uh... So now let's have a look at some of the other things we can check on the crankshaft, and that is the journal uh, to make sure that it is a, a, a perfect circle and uh, that it is the shape is true from one end to the other. All right. So what we do to make sure that the the journal is round is we use micrometers we measure the journal at one angle and then we measure it at 90 degrees to compare it all right so a couple of things i want to say about this is that um, a lot of people will drive themselves crazy trying to make all of these measurements and doing each individual measurements and recording them but i want to show you uh, a little bit of a shortcut all right, so I have this micrometer, which is a two to three inch micrometer. Uh, I'm going to set it, loosen the lock, turn it, and I'm going to set it for my first journal measurement. All right, now what I want to do is I want to measure it at this position. I'm going to lock it. It slips off. And I'm not even going to look at it. I'm going to turn it 90 degrees, and I'm going to see that when I put it over the... The, the journal, it actually fits with the same amount of drag as the other angle had. So now I know that this dimension and this dimension are the same, so that is a true circle. Now to speed this up even more, I can measure all three positions at one angle and then all three positions at another angle, right? And even with that, I am still not going to look and make a reading on my micrometer. I'm simply going to rotate, rotate this up. I'm going to go to the next journal. And I'm going to measure it. Oh, and it's got a little drag. A little drag. A little drag. All right. So what I've done is now I've compared this journal to this journal. And then I'm going to do the same for the next journal. Right? And I still haven't made any reading of the micrometer. So in doing this, one thing we should say is that when these are true, and by measuring it at three different places, I'm going to uh, just talk about what the shapes are. but. I haven't actually made a whole bunch of readings and people, because they will try to do one reading and read the micrometer, another reading and read the micrometer, uh, the little changes that they have in tension will, will lead them to, to kind of second guess their measurements and think that there are problems. What I've done is just look at the friction and the drag at all of these journals and seen that they were the same and then I changed the angle and I saw that they were the same. So now I know that they are true 
and they are equal. They must be equal because if there is a change in the journal dimension, then that would mean that there's uh, not only that there is some wear there, but when the crankshaft is torquing and bending, that that smaller diameter will become a focal point for that force to work and we will end up having a failure at that point. Now the same thing can be true for the main journals. A little bigger, so I've got a three to four inch micrometer. Now this journal is much narrower, so at best I'm probably only going to measure two positions. Right? Left side, or my left side, right side, then 90 degrees, 90 degrees, and again, I can do that same, same process where I go to the next journal and still got a drag, got a drag. Now, I, so really, I've made all of my journal uh, readings without having to read the micrometer 50 times. All right, and what I would like to see in every one of these, if you think about it, on a long journal like this, you are going to make three readings on this angle and three readings on this angle. So that's 6, 12, 18, 24, and then two for each of the other five, and that, or four for each of the other five is another 20. All of those readings now can be done with, with simply just moving the micrometer from one place to the other. Now, once that I have made my readings, I can look at my measurements, write them down, and then I know that every journal is the same size and it is the, a good shape, all right? And we're gonna turn the camera over and onto the whiteboard. I just wanna talk about the shapes. Okay, so uh, looking at the shapes that we have here, right, um, true, so basically from one end of, of the journal to the other end of the journal, uh, there's no change in size at either 90 degrees of rotation, so that is, a, that is what we are actually really looking for, that's the only one that's acceptable. Uh, from the next one, hourglass, so, and again, the dark part in the middle is the actual journal, so if the middle was narrower than the two outsides, that would be an hourglass shape. Uh, barrel shape, the opposite of an hourglass shape, so the middle is actually bigger than either of the two outside, and uh, taper is pretty straightforward. Uh, one edge is, is bigger and the opposite edge is smaller, and that is a taper journal. Okay, so now I want to look at oil flow uh, into the crankshaft and how those journals uh, get lubed. So we talked about the, the block having an oil galleries through it that were cross-drilled and intersected and allowed oil to come through the friction bearing into the main journal. Well, what we're going to see on this is that the, the crankshaft actually has drillings in it as well and you can see my, uh, my tie wrap is moving through there quite easy. All right, so the oil is held in by the friction bearing uh, because it's so close, but we have a little bit of clearance. That oil being held in there forces some of the oil to travel into these holes. What that does is, um, and we, I'm going to spin it around, you're going to see that we have two, um, that, that is drilled straight through the center of that main journal. But the connecting rod journal has two holes in it. Now remember that this being a V8 uh, crankshaft will have two connecting rods on this one journal. That is why it is so long. So one connecting rod journal or crank pin will be connected and it will get its oil through there. Um, actually, and you can, uh, can't get it to turn and come up, but that, that hole actually intersects both of these holes in here in that drilling. So the oil from this will actually go to both of these crank pins. All right. And then if we look on the other one and try the other side, we will see that it, there's more along the lines of what I was actually hoping for. If you can see it, we have my main journal 
is going to supply this crank pin with oil and this main journal is going to supply this crank pin with oil. Now what you will typically see on the specifications for the oil clearance on these two journals, on the main journal it usually is a little tighter and that is to hold the oil in here uh, for a couple of reasons. A to keep your oil pressure up but B is we don't want as much oil to leak out here because we want to be able to force it up to the crank pin journal. If these are a little looser, um, the oil leaking out of here, as this crankshaft is spinning around, it will actually aid in throwing that oil up onto the, the cylinder walls to help cool the engine. All right, um, we should go over the components or the names of these parts. Um, so I'm probably gonna do this and slide the, the crankshaft as opposed to moving it. So I've already said this is the main journal. This is the crank pin. The crank pin is, in this case is a, a double wide because it is a V8 block and we're going to have two uh, connecting rods uh, connected to it. This part, the offset from this um, uh, main journal to this crank pin is supported by a web. All right. The counterbalance is the heavy weight that's uh, associated or, or positioned and it's usually on uh, offset from the crank pin so that when this is moving up in the cylinder that the, the weight is actually moving down and helping give us a little bit of inertia to, to do, keep the, the, that piston moving up in the cylinder a little easier. All right, and on the back side, all right, or the, the rear of it, I'm going to spin it around. We have a position for the, the, the seal to be located to keep the oil in the engine. And on the very back of it, you, uh, you will see that we have a, a bolt pattern which is going to allow me to attach, attach my, my drive on the back of the engine, whether it's a, a flywheel or a, a pressure plate or, you know, f so that we can drive our transmission. On the front, we have a couple of things. We have a flat area here and on this engine that flat is actually uh, there to provide a drive to the oil pump with the Garretter style pump. We have again a seal on the front of it uh, and we have a drive gear which will mesh with my camshaft drive gear to uh, provide timing. Uh, there should be some kind of a timing mark on here and on the camshaft gear to al uh, allow it to, uh, to be positioned in the, at the correct orientation. Never forget that when you stick this back in, it has to be correct. Um, The other component that is usually associated on the front of that crankshaft is the harmonic balance. All right, now I've dragged this one over here. Uh, I'm going to hold it and turn it around a couple of different ways so you can see it. Um, this is a harmonic balance and what we have is we have a heavy steel weight on the outside. We have a, a rubber inset, insert in the middle which is bonded to each of these steel components. All right. Um, and there's the uh, position for my, my seal right there. Um, I wanted to talk about this because, and just to, to, so we could go over it. Um, when my crankshaft accelerates every time that a, uh, a piston begins to fire and, and have an effect or a, a turning force on the crankshaft, the center of this, this harmonic balance will want to accelerate at the same rate that the, the crankshaft is accelerating. The idea of having the rubber in between is that the center can actually start to, to rotate faster than the outside is turning. But we can't uh, lose the energy, so what happens then is, with a slight delay, the outside starts to accelerate. But by this time the center may be starting to decelerate and what will happen then is the outside, the heavy weight portion, will actually try and, and keep the speed up of the middle. So it provides a, um, a smoothening out of the speed changes or the speed fluctuations that occur on a, on a crankshaft. All right, uh, 
It also can provide a drive for uh, pulley, and we can also have a timing mark on there. Uh, the, the rest of this would be on the front of the block, uh, which will help you identify top dead center uh, when you're uh, building your engine. All right, we're going to look at some uh, cylinder head crack detection. Now, this particular cylinder head, uh, they uh, left it full of water over the winter and it cracked, so we have the lots of multiple cracks and we've used it a lot. Uh, so you, know, you can actually physically see the cracks in here. Um, we're going to use some uh, reddish iron filings on here and sprinkle it on and you can see that that's coming on there. All right, you would do your entire head, but uh, just for demonstration por por purposes, we're going to uh, position the, the electromagnet on the, over the head, and when we energize it, you can see what has happened is we have created a bunch of uh, changes in the, in the magnetic field where instead of having just a north and a south uh, on, a north and a south on the uh, the electromagnet because there is a crack in it what happens is we create another north and south and opposites uh, uh, create uh, attract each other and what they have done is they have attracted the the red um, filings then over to that crack now these have um, inserts on the bottom of them because they are a pre-combustion chamber it was a small diesel head and because that pre-combustion chamber is essentially a crack in that as well, it has dragged some filings over to that seam as well. So we have one here, one here, there's some there, and there's some over here. Uh, and again, you know, it, 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 it's just a matter of putting more filings on, energizing it, moving it away, and looking for the cracks. There's one there. Uh, some, we need a little bit over here, do this, right, and you can see this come up, every, every crack is essentially, uh, becomes a little bit more clear to see. So another type of crack detection is dye penetrant, and with this we use a penetrant uh, which has a, a coloring to it, and it is designed so that when we spray it on, it has a very thin uh, uh, texture to it, and it will run into any cracks that are, are present on the surface. Um, after it has sat there for a while, we simply clear it off, and then we spray it with the developer. And the developer, as you can see on this, is, is a very chalky looking uh, thing, and it goes on wet, but it dries very quickly. So. The principle is then it acts like a sponge on the top and where the penetrant has soaked into the crack and didn't get wiped off that when the, the, the developer uh, dries it acts as a sponge and it brings it up to the surface and you can see where the crack is there. Now one huge advantage for this would be to use on any aluminum components because uh, magnetism is not going to work on it uh, like we had a, a few minutes ago on the on the uh, Magnaflux. Um, the other thing that this would be good for is sometimes on the engine like a crankshaft where you want to inspect maybe the journal uh, uh, for cracks and it would be very difficult to get the, the iron filings to sit on all of the surfaces while you're trying to get the, 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 the Magnaflux uh, in there and, and, and electrocute or, or Magnaflux. The, 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 um. So this would be really useful on an uh, aluminum head where uh, magnetism isn't going to work from a Magnaflux. And for odd shaped uh, items that you want to check for cracks, say like a crankshaft journal where it's going to be round and uh, when you put the iron filings on they're simply going to fall off or not going to sit on that surface for you uh, while you're, you're trying to uh, create a magnetic field around them. So that would be uh, an absolute benefit for this style.